Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, as Andy said, uh, John uh, is my research partner. He can't be here right now, but I think he's watching. Uh, so if I get questions that are too hard for me, I will send them off to him. Um, we have been working together for almost five years, which is kind of crazy. Uh, when we started, my hair looked like that. And uh, during the time that we've been working together, John got married and finished a PhD thesis. And all I did was this and moved to California. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we started at Princeton in 2018. Uh, now it's cross-institutional because I left. Um, and basically we started out as this kind of effort to discover uh, textual parallels, reuse, and other things, but based on phonology, on sound, uh, what John calls resonance. Um, here's a little picture of a program that I wrote a couple of years ago uh, that takes in two uh, old Chinese texts, um, and it spits out, hey, there's a, a correlation here. These texts might uh, match, or they might have rhymed when they were originally read aloud. And here's the transcriptions uh, in old Chinese, which no one except John can read, but they're fun to look at. Um, what is the problem we were trying to solve? Okay, uh, a little bit of textual history. We're interested in texts from early China. What does that mean? Well, there's this canon of received texts that have been passed down by scribes uh, for centuries, um, about as long as we have had texts, uh, and a lot of them also have a, a, a critical history that's about as long as the text is. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, the Laozi, which is more commonly known in English as the Tao Te Ching, this classical work of Taoism is the one that a lot of people know. Um, we also have these fragmentary texts. Every so often someone will find like a tomb in China and dig it up and they'll get these uh, uh, texts that were written on bamboo strips that seem to parallel in interesting ways these received versions that have been passed down for about 2,000 years, and that creates this awesome climate where there are these active scholarly debates about the meaning, the dating, the authorship, other stuff, going back you know, 2,000 years and still very active today for all of these same texts. Uh, that's a picture of what those texts actually look like when they're written on bamboo strips. Um, when people dig them out of the tomb, uh, they used to be kind of connected together with like fiber uh, and other things, which has long since rotted away, so you get this great game of like pick up sticks uh, and of course, there are no page numbers, so it's really fun to try and figure out what the uh, order things were originally in. Uh, but we don't have to do that. Um, okay, phonology. Why are we interested in it? Uh, these ongoing debates about who wrote something or why uh, or what pieces of something get reused or when it was written, uh, we think that phonology adds this critical but often forgotten dimension to these debates, uh, particularly because these texts have a really high degree of wordplay, puns, rhymes, which are really easy in Chinese, but also more complex poetic structures with really interesting deep rhyme schemes. Um, the early texts also often feature a high degree of graphic variation because the orthography was not stable, so you could use different characters to write the same word. And helpfully, there are these polyphonic characters that can have different meanings and make different sounds depending on context. So the problem runs both ways. Um, Here's an example you can see of some uh, pictures of uh, bamboo manuscripts where the same word that might be pronounced the same way is written in these differing uh, character forms, which, as you can see, can be substantially different. Uh, and here's an example of the other direction where you have these character forms that are the same. Um, and in fact, the, second, the one on the bottom is true for modern Chinese, too, where uh, the single character, depending on the context it's used, can represent concepts as different as music and joy uh, and can even be pronounced different ways. Uh, so what does all of this mean? Uh, well, it means that sometimes the resonance and reuse in the text may not be visually apparent unless you know what it sounded like. Uh, here's an example that uh, John uh, got from three different texts. Um, how do we know that there's reuse happening here? Well, some of it is visually apparent, right? We have this phrase, san yan bui, uh, uh, bui yan. he did not speak for three years. Uh, so, so something has been copied, uh, but there's more going on here than that under the surface. Um, these two characters uh, sound uh, almost the same uh, and have a similar meaning, uh, right? We have this, his acting without words was harmonious. When he did speak, it was joyous. Um, but there's, there's more parallel there than would otherwise appear because the characters look different. Similarly, we have this even more interesting instance. Uh, these uh, two characters sound almost the same, but the meaning is actually, uh, there's a, a substantial difference, right? He trusted in dark seclusion versus he was truly left in the dark. And again, probably what happened was as these things were read aloud, um, you know, the texts were kind of uh, broken up into modular units and rearranged, people recited poetry or whatever, uh, the way that they were transcribed drifted. Uh, and so the, the full extent of this resonance is hidden unless you know what things sounded like. Um, okay, so what do we want to do? Uh, we are working backwards. Our outcome is that we want to find hidden patterns uh, in the text based on sound. That means we need to know the pronunciation for every character in a text. If we're going to do that, we need to create a model that can predict the pronunciation for a single character. And if we're going to do that, then we need to represent that pronunciation as data and generate training data for the model from it. Uh, so my favorite framework is Spacey. So in Spacey's terms, uh, you put a bunch of text in the top, it goes through this big pipe, and you get data at the bottom. Uh, what we're going to put into the top of the pipe is two different Chinese texts, and at the bottom, we're going to get out some 
something that says, hey, there's resonance here. There's a match. Something is going on that you didn't otherwise see. Uh, to do that, uh, in Spacey, our token needs to know how you read it. So it has to have pronunciation data so that we can know when things are a match. To do that, we need a model where you can put tokens in on one end, and the, the model can say, here, this character should be read this way. Uh, and to do that, we need uh, texts where the pronunciation of every character is annotated. Uh, okay, here's my first pass at doing this. Uh, we are going to curate a representative corpus of early Chinese texts in digital form, which is really easy thanks to the Consecu repository, which uh, curates digital versions of these texts. And they're free and open source. It's incredible. I'll talk your ear off about it later if you want. Um, we're going to get pronunciation data for how to pronounce the characters from a published linguistic reconstruction of Old Chinese, which was made by some really smart linguists. Um, so that's great. We have a table of how to pronounce things. Um, for characters that only make one sound, there's no variance. We'll just use whatever is in this published linguistic reconstruction table. For characters that are polyphonic, where the sound could change, we will add manual annotations. And by we, I mean John. Um, then we're going to make a custom NLP component that is basically just a classifier that adds phonological data to each token. Uh, here is what that ended up looking like. Um, and you can immediately notice if you look at what this thing predicted in my early draft that there are some problems and it performed really badly. Uh, so one thing that's immediately evident is that a bunch of these things that predicted pronunciation is an underscore, which is not a character in early Chinese. Uh, that's because we were missing a lot of data. Uh, the phonological reconstruction uh, published by these linguists uh, does not include data for a huge variety of characters that appear in these poems. Uh, so we would either have to make things up or find some other data. Um, also, doing this manual annotation process is not sustainable with one annotator uh, who is writing a PhD thesis. Uh, how do we get more training data? Enter the text. Someone else did this before us 1,500 years ago. Um, there is a work called the Jingian Shirwen, or Explanatory Glosses on the Classics, which I will here and after just call the JDSW because it's easier. Uh, this was completed in the late 6th century by a scholar named Lu Deming, who we owe a huge amount. Um, and it takes this interesting form of an exegetical dictionary, which means that it's about 55,000 different annotations that are linked to excerpts from ancient classic texts. Not the full thing, but enough that you can figure out this came from this book. Here's my note on it. What are the notes? Well, it focuses primarily on showing how to pronounce things correctly in context and how they were supposed to be read in the old ways, which is exactly what we want. And it does it for 16 different books. It also covers notes on what things used to mean uh, and editions that reproduce characters differently, which is great. And it cites up to 200 different other authors and works, uh, which is amazing. Here's uh, one edition of what that text looked like. You can see on the right, uh, the like half-width red characters are like the notes, and the big black characters are the chunks of the text that are being annotated. Um, so here's a simple example. Uh, this is from a text that's like a divinatory oracular thing that allows you to sort of see the future. Um, and it's talking about uh, these lines, like in that image in the top right, which form uh, basically like the representation of the future that you read. Um, and the lines can be uh, broken, like a yin, if you know yang and yin, the broken line is yin and the strong line is yang, so the strong and the weak. Uh, that is the piece of the text that this annotation is for. Um, that's an example of the fortune tellers that still use this technique. Um, here's what the JDSW says. This strong and weak thing, well, the character that's strong is pronounced like this. Uh, which, by the way, this uses this really interesting uh, phonological system that was novel at the time, borrowed via Sanskrit linguists, uh, where you can indicate the pronunciation of something by taking two pieces from other characters that you know how to pronounce. My favorite example for this is it's like taking the f from fish and the ite from light to make fight. So in this case, we have the d from dung and the wang for something else to make tuang. Um, Here's a more complex example showing just how rich this text is. Uh, this is the same text for annotating a different part. Um, here's the annotation. Uh, you can see how, just how much is like packed into this very terse text. We have a note about other editions that reproduce it differently. Um, you know, a bunch of different pronunciations, multiple other people that we're citing that are explaining how to do this. Um, so there's just so much here. Uh, how do we turn this into training data? Well, uh, if you look at uh, the actual annotations that are in this text, uh, you notice really quickly that there's this like massive outlier. A ton of them consist only of two or three characters. Why is that? Um, it's because they're just pronunciation data. That's it. Um, there are two forms that the pronunciation data often takes. One of them is that A plus B thing that I explained. The other one is just, it sounds like X. Um, it turns out that fully half of this work almost is just explaining how to pronounce things. Uh, so let's just take that and make it the training data. Um, there's a problem with that. 
If you look at common bigrams in the text, uh, these uh, that I'm kind of pointing to here uh, pointed me in a different direction because those mean something like below it's the same. And when I saw that, I was like, oh shit, what is the same? Uh, so if you see something like this, what it actually means is that every other time you saw this excerpt in the original text, you would apply the same annotation. That potentially multiplies the amount of data hugely, adding new training data and context in every case. Uh, so if we're missing out on that, we're missing a massive amount of training data that we could use for our model. Uh, and also, what about the entities that are in there? Like, who said all of these things? What if we could get that? Uh, well, what if we had a model that could distinguish all the different parts of an annotation? What if we had a model to annotate the training data for our model? Where would we get the training data for that model? Um, most NLP libraries want you to do kind of a common set of things, tokenization, POS tagging, named entities, dependency parsing. Uh, this is Spacey's idea of like a core NLP model. It turns out that's really hard for this language and text. There's no white space, there's no punctuation, there's no sentences. Entities are often multiple characters, but almost everything else is just a single character. What even are parts of speech in this language? Uh, in that form of the like A plus B, uh, what is the thing that indicates A plus B? Is that a verb? Is it a punctuation? How do you even decide this? Uh, lots of other questions. How do we get useful data out of this? Uh, what if I told you that if you broke all the rules uh, and substantially lowered your expectations, you could get great training data out of data like this? Uh, what if we treat everything as a labeled span of one character tokens? Uh, so we have people, we have works, we have graphic notes about how things are reproduced differently, we have notes about the meaning of things, we have notes about the pronunciation of things, and we have the metas about apply this to everything below. Let's deliberately avoid trying to label anything else. We only care about what helps us answer our research questions. We only care about things a model could reasonably be expected to learn. And we only care about things we actually feel confident annotating. These are decisions that I made. Uh, so let's write an algorithm that annotates the data. Uh, we're going to think about the most common patterns we saw, maybe write some regular expressions. We're going to write a few tests that apply the logic to make sure we're doing what we think we want. And we're going to really quickly find that the data is going to break the algorithm, which is good. We're going to repeat this process over and over. We're going to find crazy data that the algorithm can't annotate correctly. We're going to write a failing test. We're going to adjust the algorithm and make it crazier, and it's going to get uglier and uglier. You can do this, by the way, without writing any code. You just have to think about the forms of the data uh, takes. That's what my regular expressions actually look like. Terrifying, uh, but it's useful. I'll tell you why. I'm going to skip this slide uh, about creating two data sets. Um, here's why. Uh, when you use the algorithm to pre-annotate the data for you, all you have to do is correct its predictions. Uh, and the Prodigy Annotation Library makes this super easy. Um, I was going to show a live demo of this. I'll just really quickly alt tab so you can see what the interface looks like. I know I'm like already way out of time. Um, this is the actual annotation interface that I use. When I see things that I'm annotating, I hit the A key to accept. This is an annotation using the schema that I picked. Everything was already pre-annotated by the algorithm that I wrote. If there was a mistake, I would just go in here, get rid of this, pick a different label, and move on. And it's as easy as that. Um, I'll wrap up. Uh, here's, here's what I'm really arguing, I guess, with this, this demo. Um, yeah, I use Spacey's span categorizer. This is the performance for each of the things. Uh, why do I think it did well? Because uh, secondary sources are a really good source for training data. Uh, they're formulaic. You can write algorithms that describe them really well. And as a bonus, you get a deeper understanding of the relationships between things in your text. Trying to describe your data with a set of rules is a great process because it dredges up all the outliers, the things that you don't know, and it helps you challenge your own assumptions about the shape of your data. Uh, and finally, you can do better if you just try to avoid complexity and just only annotate and predict the things that you need to move forward. Curate adversarially so that your annotated data is a mix of crazy edge cases and real examples, and you can always add more details later. Thanks.